Hello, this is my fourth attempt at doing this. Thank God. I, uh, it seems to be working a little bit right now, and we'll, hopefully uh, we'll have a nice recording here. This is about the proximal upper extremity and uh, the shoulder complex. I call it part one because we have everything up to uh, and including the rotator cuff. So this, this actual PowerPoint presentation is going to include um, the kinesiology of the shoulder and in the kinesiology of the shoulder, there's a lot more muscles we're going to go over on part two. So it only covers um, the biggest components, which include the scapular motions. Now remember, kinesiology is a study of movement and the components associated with that movement. So we have to talk about the ligaments and we have to talk about the connective tissues associated with the joints uh, and, the joint, and, and the joint complex. So we're not going to go too detailed into it. And you'll see we're going to talk about the... the uh, the fibrous sheath and the capsule and we'll talk about the labrum you can't have a good discussion without the labrum it's actually a fascinating dynamic structure so let's go on so let's go through this i'm going to try and record this i'm recording it right now hopefully it'll come out great so the shoulder complex not just a glenohumeral joint you know when we think of the shoulder most people think about that shoulder being the most freely movable joint in the body and it is it has a very shallow um, concavity to the glenoid cavity versus the acetabulum of the hip is very deep structure and allows a nice ball and socket connection and it has less movement the hip has less movement than the shoulder the shoulder has a lot more movement the other fascinating thing about our upper extremity our whole entire upper extremity really only firmly attaches to the thorax or the or the um uh, the body wall at the sternum, the sternoclavicular joint. So we'll look a little bit at that. And we'll talk about how the shoulder can be deepened. That socket becomes deepened. How does it become deepened? Through the labrum. And we'll talk about the percentages. It, it deepens it superior to inferiorly and medial to laterally or anterior to posterior, actually, is a better term for that, not medial to lateral. So here, the shoulder complex is actually not just a glenohumeral joint and professor oriyama went over this for our students and his knowledge of the shoulder is amazing i can never come close to it but we'll try and do my best to make something solid for you so that you have good notes and we'll have good questions after this uh, for you to do to keep it straightforward and you have something to work with so the shoulder complex has seven articulations it has the glenohumeral joint like we discussed already the suprahumeral joint, which is above uh, the glenoid cavity and below the acromion process. And then you have the acromial clavicular joint between the acromion process of the scapula and the clavicle. And then you have the sternoclavicular joint. Like I said, that is the anchoring point to the thorax of the upper extremity. And we all know this already by now. We've talked about it so much, how the scapula is actually not really attached by ligaments, it's, it's actually attached by muscles. And then the scapula has to be stabilized in order to have proper shoulder function. So the first part of our discussion on the muscles and the movements will be on the scapula. It makes a lot of sense because we have to have a foundation to work with. Now it's important to note that um, the upper extremity and all the muscles that move the shoulder are innervated by the brachial plexus. And that's from C5 to T1. And uh, it's significant clinically when you're evaluating a person for the pathology of a shoulder problem is that you need to realize the, the typical patterns that each one of these levels will present with. And what do I mean by that? Um, we have to make sure that in the evaluation of the shoulder and the movement of the shoulder, that these levels will present their own characteristic patterns and evaluation of the integrity of the neurological levels is important and it depends upon a knowledge of one dermatomes sensation two myotomes muscle and three reflexes and furthermore hoppenfeld states in his orthopedic neurology book um, by lippincott on page one actual page one he says it's through clinical now listen guys because this is what we're doing with those other videos in the lab it is through clinical evaluation of motor power. That was the first thing he says, motor power. What is motor power? 
manual muscle testing, right? How do you evaluate motor power? Through manual muscle testing. And sensation, you've learned about two-point discrimination. And reflexes, that, that will be deep tendon reflexes. So it is through the clinical evaluation of motor power, sensation, and reflexes that correct neurological level of involvement can be established. Page one, Hoppenfeld. And, you know, as a neurologist they, or an orthopedist, they usually just do a, a, a few tests. But as an OT, you can see that we uploaded very specific muscle tests for each action. And it's a little more specific. Our grading in occupational therapy is a lot more intense than your typical neurological exam. And we have beautiful videos we made. Thank God we have those videos. So you have the sternoclavicula, and that's the anchoring point for the shoulder. And the scapula is going to be gliding. Like I said, it's not connected by ligaments. It's connected by muscles and has to glide around the ribs. So they call it the scapulocostal area where the, the subscapula fossa is gliding around the convexity of the ribs. The subscapula fossa is concave, kind of like a, a shell on the beach you get for an ashtray, how it's got that concavity. Not quite as concave, but it allows for that gliding around the ribs. And the ribs are more convex. They're like a mountain. So they have to be able to glide smoothly around that. If it doesn't glide smoothly, we have problems. Also, you have to be able to stabilize that moving scapula when you try to move the humerus in different directions. And then when you do reach and grab things, realize that the ribs are involved. So we call those the costal sternal joints and the costal vertebral joints. And that's the costal sternal is where the ribs articulate with the sternum. And the costal vertebral is where the ribs articulate with the vertebrae. Make sense? So you're just naming it according to the connection. And the shoulder complex have uh, one, two, three, four, five participating general bones. You have the humerus, the clavicle, the sternum, the 12 ribs, uh, and the 12 thoracic vertebrae. The fibrous capsule, um, if you look at this image, it says joint, shoulder joint capsule. And you look at that capsule surrounding the uh, head of the humerus as it goes into the glenoid cavity. The fibrous capsule has a uh, glenoid cavity and a glenohumeral ligaments. So we're going to look at those right now. So if you look at this slide, you see the synovial sheath forms the capsule and has three thickenings. You have the superior glenohumeral humeral ligament. So now you look at that capsule, you go back a couple of slides. I'm just going to do that for a moment. We go back to the capsule. Oh, it's not letting me do it. Okay, never mind. So if you look at when you get a chance, go back to the capsule. It actually is broken down into three parts, a superior, middle, and a low and inferior part. The superior part becomes thickened and it re, uh, creates what's called the superior glenohumeral ligament. And that resists inferior translation of the humeral head. That means the sliding down, the sliding and gliding straight down of the humeral head. That would be a bad problem. And that you could see that with a lot of upper motor neuron lesions where the shoulder completely comes out of the joint like that. So this ligament helps to check that movement. The middle glenohumeral ligament is going to limit external rotation. And it contributes to the anterior stability of the shoulder especially at the 45 degrees of abduction. And then the inferior glenohumeral ligament all the way to the right. And you notice sometimes in the book it says IGHL, the inferior glenohumeral ligaments. The IGHL um, has a posterior band and an anterior band. The posterior band and the anterior band work together. Look at the bottom paragraph there. The, both the posterior and the anterior band stabilize the shoulder when externally rotated and abducted as well. But when you look at the posterior band above, uh, looking at the uh, paragraph on the right, the posterior band stabilizes the capsule inferiorly and posteriorly when internally rotated as well. And the anterior band stabilizes the capsule anteriorly. But both posterior and anterior bands stabilize the externally rotated shoulder and uh, in abduction. Now, this image of the labrum is not the best image, but if you look at the purple surrounding the, the, uh, the, the actual glenoid, it's actually showing you that's supposed to be cartilage. It's a fibrocartilage, 
and it creates like a cup. So let's look at this glenolabrum. And this labrum is extremely important. Um, one reason is that the labrum, if you did not have it, look at the left side of the screen where it says without the labrum, the glenohumeral joint loses its stability by 20% without a labrum. So without having this fibrocartilage disc, the joint would be 20% less stable. And what it does, it actually deepens the socket. So it puts this cup on it to deepen the socket, and that, that will deepen the socket 75% in the vertical and 57% transversely. So it helps to bring that uh, humeral head a little deeper into some sort of structure. And that humeral, yes, the humeral head. And the labrum is dynamic. That's very important. What do we mean by that? Well, it's a fibrocartilage disc, but it can, it can actually uh, change its shape with motion. It can give. Now, that's if it's a healthy labrum. Sometimes your labrum can be unhealthy, just like all your discs can be. And that would be with certain disease or metabolic problems. And number one is lack of hydration, because discs need lots of water. Um, and chronic wear and tear could actually break it down, cause scar tissue and affect it. And how do you get chronic wear and tear? Through malaligned bones and repetitive use. I, always, I think when I think about a labrum problem, I think about people, athletes, especially um, a, a pitcher, the way they externally rotate that shoulder and puts a lot of stress on it and then whip it. So let's look all the way to the right. You have the labrum as a suction cup. So what the labrum has a vacuum effect on the head of the humerus. It's similar to a suction cup. So it helps to keep that humerus a little deeper and helps to hold it in place better. Now there are six motions of the scapula. This is key. We have to understand the scapula before we can understand the rest of the shoulder. And we know this, you have elevation. If you look at the picture to the left, you see the two arrows pointing up showing that the scapula is just going straight up linearly, elevating straight up. That's what elevation is, a linear glide and slide straight up. If you look at depression, it's a linear glide and slide straight down. Now you'll see in this PowerPoint, I have a video of someone doing scapula exercises. I purposely put it there to show the first part of that video where it shows him doing scapula depression and it's a demonstration of uh, closed chain scapular depression. It's important to note, as we'll see, that the scapulas naturally will be back down to normal position depressed unless you have a hypertonic muscles above. So we'll see, and we'll look at the muscles that move the scapula, and you can see a lot of people do have hypertonic muscles above, meaning tight superior aspect of the trapezius and a tight levator scapula will keep that scapula up raised high when it shouldn't be because you're holding it tight. And then the third picture there to the right on the first row is shows you a deduction, also known as retraction of the scapula, bringing the scapula back to midline. That video demonstrates it really well. The guy is really good when he demonstrates it. And then you, the bottom left shows scapula abduction, also known as scapula protraction. And then the one in the middle is showing upward rotation. Now, when we talk about uh, rotation, we're talking about the inferior angle, or you can actually just take your hands, place your hands in front of you with your thumbs medially, and, uh, and then just put your thumbs to, in, in hands with your line, with your fingers, and just take your uh, arm and bring your, bring your actual hands upward and outward. And you can see that's the scapula movement. And then if you bring them uh, upward rotation, that means you're bringing the bottom part of your hands upward and outward. And if you're doing scapular uh, rotation downward, you bring your bottom of your hands downward and close to the midline. All right. Now, the muscles that move the scapula, we'll talk about the ones above and we'll talk about the ones below. The ones above, and this is a good way just to remember it so you can keep it simple at first, is that you have muscles that start above something that's going to move it and muscles that start below that are going to move it. And obviously, where the starting point is, is the origin and usually the fixed point. So here we're seeing the trapezius muscle and the levator scapula. And those are the two muscles I want you to focus on this slide. Don't worry about the other ones. So upward... Um, elevation of the, of the scapula 
is accomplished by these two muscles here, the levator scapula, hence its name. But think of Geppetto and Pinocchio, and he's bringing uh, the puppet's hand up. So look at the, the uh, scapula, and you bring that scapula up. Geppetto pulls from the top. So your levator scapula is pulling, and then the trapezius muscle has three parts to it. The upper, middle, and lower traps actually have three different innervations, and you can control three separate movements here. The cat, if you've ever dissected the cat, they break the, sca uh, the shoulder, uh, they break the trapezius muscle down into three separate muscles. They call it the clavotrapezius, the chromiotrapezius, and the spinotrapezius. We call it the upper trap, middle trap, and lower trap. And uh, so the upper trapezius fibers, you can see how it's starting from the occiput and the spines of the uh, uh, cervical spine all the way down. But the upper fibers would be going to around C7. And that would be actually pulling that scapula up. So the scapular depression is naturally occurring with gravity when you sit up. So with gravity, it's it actually the scapula should come down and be normal. But when you use it against resistance, such as when you're using a crutch, you have to walk with a crutch, the lower traps, latissimus dorsi, and the pec major become involved. So if you go to the next slide, I'm going to see if this will work. It didn't work on the other one. I'm going to try it. If you click that, it's not going to work. Okay. So what I want you to do on this slide where it says scapula depresses, take a few moments and I want you to watch that video. As you watch that video, you can see that um, this, this gentleman's muscles, you can actually literally see the pecs major contract every time he does an L-sit. And he's, that's an L-sit is he has his hands at his side on the floor and he has his legs straight out in front of him like an L, his body's shaped like an L, and he pushes, his, pushes down, his hands are actually contacted, contra, uh, contacted with the floor he pushes down and you can see how his scapula moves down, but watch his pecs tighten up as he does that. And so you can see how the pecs are involved with that. So to go back again, oh, we're not going to go back. So let's the lower trapezius muscles, the latissimus dorsi and the pec major all do scapular depression with resistance. So the lower traps are posterior to the latissimus dorsi is posterior, but anteriorly, the pec major is actually going to pull the scapula down as well. So that is considered to be a closed chain scapula depression, what that gentleman did in, when he was sitting on the floor in the first part of the video. Um, it's important for an OT because closed chain scapula depression is necessary to do some transfers. If they have no control to those muscles, it's going to be very hard for them to, to move their body. So it's important in transfers, and the torso is moving and not the hands. So remember, what's the difference between closed chain and open chain? It's really not complicated. Closed chain, the distal part of an extremity is not moving, the, but the body is moving. Whereas a open chain, the distal part of the extremity moves, but the body doesn't. So you can see that in this. So open chain scapular depression, the scapula would move and so would the upper extremity. So if he wanted to do that same movement without having the uh, hands on the floor, the arms hanging along the side in the chair, just push your hands down and you can see that you're using your pecs as you push down and you're using your lower traps and you're lose, using the lats to push the hands down. The hands would be moving down. Now rotation of the scapula, we went through the different motions. Let's look at the muscles that rotate the scapula. In your book, they talk about three hands on the steering wheel. And so if you look, the upper trap would be one hand, the lower trap would be another hand, and the serratus anterior would be another hand. So imagine three hands on that parts of the scapula, each one helping to turn and rotate that scapula uh, to the left, like you're making a left turn. And that upward rotation is the inferior angle is moving upward and outward. And then downward rotation in the right image is showing you how the rhomboids and the levator scapula and the pec minor are accomplishing that. So upward rotation of the scapula includes the upper traps, lower serratus anterior, and the lower traps. So let's look at the upper traps. The upper traps will pull the acromium upward. Remember how it goes from the occipital bone and down on an angle to the acromion process. 
and you can imagine when that contracts it's a nice angle and it's actually pulling the steering wheel to the left and the second one there is showing the lower serratus anterior um, is pulling the angle in laterally and contributing to upward rotation of the scapula and so the lowest serratus anterior excuse me with this phone i'm sorry uh, the lower serratus anterior pulls the angle laterally. So if you look at the lower serratus anterior, where is it attaching? It's actually attaching to the medial border uh, of the scapula. And also what it does, it actually will pull that scapula. I'm sorry, it, it's attaching to the lower portion of the scapula. The lower trapezius inserts to the root of the spine of the scapula. So let's look at this here. Here's a good picture. Now this one I got off the internet uh, for imaging and it shows you um, one, two, three, four, five hands here. But what we're, we're gonna focus on is the upper trap, lower trap, and serratus anterior. And the upper trap is demonstrated with the UT. The lower trap is demonstrated with the LT and the serratus anterior is, uh, um, demonstrated with the SA so you can't you can't say all these movements are just from those three muscles because if you lift your arm up it actually the deltoids involved too and we'll talk about that later but the upper traps are attached to the um, acromion process and it's pulling it upward from the top toward the left the lower traps are attached to the the root of the spine, remember we talked about the root of the spine in AMP1 or anatomy. And then the serratus anterior are attached to the medial border, but the lower fibers of the serratus anterior here are being contracted. And so that actually is like another hand on the wheel. So four hands, five hands, it doesn't matter. We're talking about three muscles that you need to know. Upper trap, lower trap, serratus anterior help in upward rotation. So, and then you can have a partial and a full downward rotation. If you look at this image here, downward rotation is bringing it back towards the midline. Upward rotation is bringing that inferior angle up and outward. But also you can have a posterior and an anterior tilting of the scapula. And then you can get some external rotation and internal rotation, which we're not really concerned about right now. But let's look at the... Uh, rotation of the scapula like pulling down of a window shade so the rhomboid major and the rhomboid minor let's see it on the next image so you have the rhomboid major you see the bottom arrow there the big thick one and the rhomboid minor is the second one in between those two muscles when they pull they actually will um, act like a uh, closed blind and pull that scapula back in and they, and it's for downward rotation. It will bring the inferior angle back down towards the midline. The pectoralis minor on the anterior side can actually tip uh, the top of the scapula down. You can see how it's starting from below in the ribs and attaching above at the coracoid process. If it contracts from the bottom and pulls, it's going to pull the coracoid process and tip it down anteriorly. Scapular protraction versus retraction. So protraction is also known as abduction. Let's look on the left side. So scapular protraction, if you want to write also abduction of the scapula, you have the serratus anterior. And the serratus anterior has fibers that are attaching not only on the lower angle, but also on the medial border of the scapula or the vertebral side, the vertebral border, same thing, medial border of the scapula and vertebral border are same, same. So look, let's read this. Serratus anterior is under the scapula and it inserts on the medial side of the scapula. This medial attachment allows the scapula to be moved forward, pulling the vertebral border closer to the ribs. So what's great about this muscle is that it's very close to the ribs and the way it's attached to the medial border, when it does pull the scapula, it hugs the ribs. And so here's the important point here in the last sentence, the serratus anterior prevents scapula winging. Okay, and then on the right side of the screen, we have retraction, otherwise known as adduction of the scapula. And we need to know that some retraction occurs from the recoil of tissues after it's been protracted. So once you reach forward with your arm 
and it comes back, it just recoils back. That's some retraction. But retraction against resistance uh, it needs muscles. And in pure retraction, that's the mid trapezius. Now you'll see a video right after, a quick, very short video showing somebody do protraction and then it'll show somebody do retraction. And the retraction video is a pure retraction because the arm is just hanging at the side. It's using just the middle fibers. But you can retract the scapula not only with the mid trapezius muscle, but if you combine it with the rhomboids, it's a stronger retraction. However, when you combine it with the rhomboids, there will be some downward rotation. So watch this video on the protraction of the scapula. It's like a minute. It's very simple. You knew this already. I just wanted to be able to demonstrate it for you. Since we're online, I can't see you, right? And then scapular retraction. This is the one with the arms at your side. Okay, so the shoulder motions, when we look at the entire shoulder complex, the shoulder can flex, extend, abduct. In the middle, we shoulder can adduct. It can internally or medially rotate, externally or lateral rotate. And then the last uh, one to the right, the shoulder can horizontally abduct or horizontally adduct. And then the combination of all shoulder movements is considered to be circumduction. So the glenohumeral joint versus the suprahumeral joint, I know that Professor Oriyama really went over this. He really covers this really well. I just wanted to bring it up again that the suprahumeral joint results from the articulation of the head of the humerus and the acromiocoracoid shelf. The glenohumeral results from the articulation of the head of the humerus and the glenoid cavity. So here are the muscles of the rotator cuff. You can see that on the on the image to the right, you're looking at the front view on the left part of that image and then the back view on the right part of that image. And when you look at the front view, you see that there's a marker that got cut off and that's marking, that's pointing to the subscapularis. And that's right underneath the scapula. That's an anterior view. And you can see peeking through there is the teres minor. And then if you look and on the view to the right, you can see your supraspinatus and infraspinatus and teres minor. So supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, subscapularis. I always memorize it as supraspinatus first because I kind of go in order. Some people memorize as subscapularis first and then supraspinatus last. It doesn't matter. Just make sure you know those muscles and what they do. Let's look at this. So the rotator cuff, it has a role in stability. It has individual actions and it has group actions. Let's look at the role of stability. The name arises out of its appearance and the function. These muscles uh, are a circular cuff. They form like a circular cuff securing the humeral head close to the glenoid fossa. Now let's look all the way to the right and really put that together for a moment. So on the right, it says group action. So the stability and group action. So we look at group action and a common downward pull on the humerus early in abduction and flexion prevents the head of the humerus from hitting the acromioclavicular shelf. And that's what they do. They act the most important aspect of that. And that combined action allows for movements beyond the 90 degrees. In the center of this slide, it says individual actions. And we're going to go through each individual muscle and their actions after this. Supraspinatus can abduct and stabilize the humeral head. Infraspinatus teres minor do the same actions. Infraspinatus external lateral rotation and extension, teres minor external lateral rotation and extension, and the subscapularis is the opposite. It's going to do internal or medial rotation. Here's a nice image of the subscapularis and on the, on the left side of the screen it talks about subscapularis actions, internal and medial rotation. On the right side of the screen, they only show you one action, but remember that, uh, I'm sorry, it is the same action, excuse me. On the right side of the screen, you see the origin insertion. Now, when you look at this muscle, this is a view from the anterior. And you see in blue showing the origin is on the subscapular fossa. And then the insertion in green is to the lesser tubercle of the humerus. Remember, we had the greater tubercle, the lesser tubercle, and the intertubercular sulcus. So you can see how it's originating medially and anteriorly, attaching to the anterior lateral aspect of the upper um, 
humerus at the lesser tubercle. And if it contracts, it can pull and rotate the humeral head. So it's internal rotation. And the teres minor, here's the teres minor. It's a tiny muscle. And you see that the teres minor does external rotation and um, or lateral rotation. And it also assists in extension. So in all these images here, it just talks about external rotation. It doesn't talk about the extension. It's an assister. It, it's a synergist of extension of the arm as well. And it's a tiny little muscle. Comes off the lateral border of the scapula. See that in blue to the right. And this is going to insert to the greater tubercle. Now what it does, this is a posterior view. So it's coming off the lateral posterior aspect of the scapula there. You can see the origin in blue. And then it goes up and it wraps around slightly to the greater tubercle. So it's actually the fibers, you can't make them out too well, but the fibers are going around anteriorly slightly to attach to the anterior superior aspect of the greater tubercle. And uh, when it contracts, it makes sense. The origin is on the scapula, the insertion is on the humerus. It's going to pull that humerus and rotate it posteriorly or externally, excuse me, rotate it externally. And it can also assist in extension of the humerus. Okay, the rotator cuff again. Here we're looking at the infraspinatus. So this is a posterior view. Everyone identify the spine of the scapula. And you can see the root of the spine and it goes all the way out. Now below that spine, you see that entire body of the scapula there, uh, the infraspinous fossa filled with a muscle and it has this uh, nice attachment to the greater tubercle the same way as the teres minor did, wrapping around and going to the anterior superior aspect of the greater tubercle. So when that it contracts, it externally rotates the arm and it also is an assister, it's a synergist of extension. And then the supraspinatus, the most commonly injured muscle in the rotator cuff, tiny little muscle found in that supraspinous fossa. You see that showing it in blue there. The origin is in the supraspinous fossa and the insertion is at the greater tubercle of the humerus, a very short muscle and it, it's positioned medially to laterally tells you what its action may possibly do, the origin being more medial, the attachment more lateral, so it would actually elevate the arm in abduction. So abduction of the humeral head and also helps to pull the head into the glenoid.